Uh, getting results at university is just the beginning. In order to secure a job, you need to be able to market yourself. Unfortunately, a number of graduates don't know how to do this. This is just one of the problems identified by advocate Tembe Gangugai Tobi, who is currently the council chair at Walter Susuli University. He joins me now to unpack this and other issues uh, facing graduates. Advocate, thank you for joining us at ENCA. Um, we talk about Walter Susuli University, and we're talking of a university that has really produced some great minds. We talk of, for example, the likes of uh, the Deputy Chief Justice, uh, Mandi Samaya, just to mention a few, and the former SAA CEO uh, but the trouble now comes at modern day where we find out that it's difficult to get the graduates to, to be placed in employment. Maybe detail some of the challenges that, that we're currently facing at Walter Sully University. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me and, and thank you for the, for the question. Yeah, I mean, wh what I was trying to highlight in my address yesterday, uh, last night rather, uh, was the, uh, to try and look at the issue of graduate unemployment as a crisis, and specifically for us as a, a university. Um, universities like UCT or, or WITS uh, would have an average of anything between nine months to a year between the date that the graduate uh, graduates, uh, you get your degree and the date you get your first job. But what we find is that with our graduates, that a period could go up to three years uh, and sometimes it can even exceed three years. So the question was, how do we understand this? How do we examine this? What are the causes and what are the reasons? So what we looked at was we graduate, firstly, we enroll approximately 30,000 students uh, every year. We graduate about uh, six to 7,000 every year. And the majority of those are diplomas and certificates. And that's where the problem really is. It's in the nature of the certificates and in the nature of the diplomas. And that's where we find that there is a high proportion of graduates that are unable to secure employment in the formal market. So there are two problems with it. The one is an external problem, and the other is an internal problem. There's very little we can do about the external problem, but we can try and resolve the endogenous uh, problem. And what are these problems? Two of them. One problem is what are the graduates studying? And what we have found is that over the years, uh, Walter Sassoli University has been a conglomeration of three different universities. But each university tended to focus on educating graduates for the public service. So focusing on diplomas like um, uh, uh, public administration or public management, and yet, the public sector has in fact not been employing for the last 20 years. There have been very, very few jobs in the public sector. And so what we are doing, we are producing graduates whose qualifications are misaligned to what the market is expecting. Now how can we change this? Because we're not going to change it tomorrow because we still have thousands of students sitting on our campuses and they're expecting to graduate. One of the solutions actually highlighted by one of uh, my colleagues who sits with me on, on council, you mentioned his name, Vianne Jahan, was that we have to think more about what does a graduate actually need. One of them is a basic skill in marketing, is that our graduates are unable to market themselves, and they are also unable to market a product. And yet, the art of selling something has been central to a functioning economy for hundreds and hundreds of years. So you could tweak the program simply by introducing a marketing program for six months, a marketing certificate for a year. And so that's one of the things we're beginning to think about in relation to how do we empower our graduates. Another concern is communication skills. This is a basic skill that every graduate ought to master. You've got to be able to communicate in a language and communicate in a way that persuades the person who's listening to you. Whether you're going to use Tosa or English, or, but you've got to have a language that you master. What we find is that the communication skills of our graduates, they may be good in the technical areas of the subjects that they are studying, but the soft communication skills are lacking. So we're thinking about uh, uh, introducing basic uh, marketing skills, basic communication skills that s immediately change the direction of the graduate.
Mm. Does the debt, because we're talking about over a billion rand in debt for many of the graduates that have their certificates or their degrees and diplomas held by the university, does that play any bearing given that they can't actually uh, apply for employment given that they owe so much? And this comes from a university, of course, that caters in large for the poorest of the poor. Yes, I mean, you're right. We cater for people that are simply financially unable to access the universities like Cape Town, Wits, uh, Stellenbosch, and Pretoria for financial reasons. They simply are unable to go there. And so they come to us either as a second or third or sometimes last resort. And sometimes they apply only at the end of February. So that's the pool that we're servicing. And primarily, they are located in the Eastern Cape. So when you describe them as the poorest of the poor, it's actually an apt description. But because they are also the poorest of the poor, what we find is that they have not been prepared for a university education by the schooling system. Because the schooling system itself that we are recruiting from is a schooling system that's not geared for university type education. So we've got a big job to bridge their uh, metric qualifications and their university life. But when they get to university, most of our students are funded by NFSAS. So they simply are unable to generate their own uh, uh, fees from private resources, either from parents or from bursaries. So we've got a very small proportion of parents that are able to pay and a very small proportion of bursaries. If actually any sponsors are listening to this show, that's one of the challenges that we face as a university. Now, until NFSAS became a fully 100% grant-based, and when it was still a loan, we generated the problem of student debt. Um, yes, it's true. Yesterday, the announcement that was made was that it's in excess of a billion. When we've looked at that number, actually, it could be slightly less. It's probably about 700, 800 million. Uh, that's student debt that we are unable to recover immediately. Now, that could potentially be a crisis. And there are two reasons why that is so. The first is that when a student actually graduates from Wusu, we don't withhold the results. They get their results. And we've had to make that concession because we recognize that to be told that you've passed but you've got no proof of passing does not help you. So we've got to be able to enable you to access the job market. Some students say, well, it's not enough to simply get my transcript. I also want a certificate. Uh, two weeks ago, we spoke to the minister, Blade Zaman. He actually came to speak at our council function. And we had the SRC there, and we, they put the specific question to the minister because it requires a national policy. If you ask me, I agree. I agree that our graduates should receive their certificates because it is a logical thing that most employers will require the actual proof that you have graduated and that you have the degree, and they should get the certificate. But unless the national policy changes in this respect, um, Walter Sassoulou University is unable to simply chart its own separate policy. Mm. I want to go then, I can't not touch on the issue of um, the accreditation, which has put the university in a bad spotlight um, on itself. Uh, is that an issue of management where the whip needs to be cracked? Because there were questions around some programs that the university had to offer. And is that a fault of management giving the bad name to the university, given that it's something that they could have dealt with? Yes. I'm glad you're asking me this question uh, a, year, uh, well, a year later. Right now, at this point in time, the issue of the five programs that had accreditation issues is over. It's been resolved. They have been uh, sanctioned and they've been approved and they've been authorized and we've actually graduated many talented students from those programs. Now you're asking me what was the problem? There were two problems uh, with accreditation. One was what is called legacy, right? When programs had to be transformed and changed from old programs to new programs where there was a lack in relation to following up with the right institutions. So you've got in these accreditation bodies, it's essentially two that play the central role. There is the Council for Higher Education, and then there is the SACWA. And both of them need to be balanced out. And what we found was that there was a lack of knowledge institutionally about which of these bodies have to perform what function. And one of the reasons why we had this problem was that in relation to our own internal systems of quality control, there were gaps there and we're trying to fix uh, those gaps. But you know, 
The major problem with this, I mean, I'm giving you the granular in relation to where within the institution. But the major problem with most of these is leadership and governance, right? So we've got to fix leadership, right? Because you've got to be able to anticipate. If you have three, four, five programs that are currently um, uh, accredited, but you know that program X, the accreditation is for three years, you know that in advance. So by the second year, you start working on the resubmission plan to the department so that when that period comes, you're not got shocked, and therefore you don't teach students when you are not yet sure that the program is uh, to be accredited. So you do it in advance. And the second thing that we've had to work with, I mean, my, this is now the end of my uh, term as council chair, because this is my second year lapses in November. The second thing I've realized since I've been in the higher education system is that governance matters. Mm -hmm. And I actually want to touch on the point that you're mentioning, it's the end of your uh, tenure as council chair. I want to reflect, because yeah. you came out, of course, um, as one of the brilliant minds of the yeah. university, left your duties to focus on the university itself, to give back, basically. Maybe take us through on some of your hits and your misses, and just how the journey has been. Yeah, I mean, I w came to serve on the council via convocation. And so the first thing I, I did about three years ago um, was that there was an upcoming annual general meeting of convocation and I made myself available. And yes, it is true that there is an element of giving back, but I was driven largely by a sense of duty. I think the mark of leadership is at the time you exit, that when you exit, there has to be able to someone else who can replicate your steps. If you live in a scenario where nobody can replicate your steps, then you have not been a good leader. So what I thought I should be able to do is to, let's go and recreate a sense of excitement about the university and also to try and understand what the problems have been. I mean, people forget, actually, that by the time we got into convocation, the LLB program, and you were talking about Justice Meyer uh, when you began this, but the LLB program had had its accreditation revoked. Fortunately, it has now been reinstated and we're trying to turn it into one of our flagship programs, like it used to be. This is not a new thing. It actually used to be one of the programs that we were proud that we have many black students who come from, at the time, the old Transkei region, you know, and enabling them to study law in a place where they can afford and in a place where the, they are familiar with its uh, setup. So one of them, the most obvious, is the reinstatement of uh, the LLB degree, which I myself you know, graduated from that school. And then the second thing was to focus on governance, because what I did establish was that when the institutions of governance are weak, the leadership tends to falter. And so we've been working on, since I became chair of council, we've been working on strengthening council itself, which means recruiting the right people with a diverse set of skills, but also with very, very strong moral um, uh, foundations and people that have played a critical role in the country as a whole. So I can give you the couple of names that we've been able to recruit. Vuyani Chakana is one of them. Tembingo Sibonagel is not an alumni of Walter Sisulu, he's from Forte, but you know what? We can educate a couple of people. Lungesa um, Fuzile <laughs> from Standard Bank. So we have truly incredible people and very strong people that serve on council. As for me, I'm pleased that when my term ends, there will be no crisis about my replacement. There are enough people in the council. All right. Advocate Tema Kanyogaitobi, thank you very much for coming through to a news night. One of the brilliant minds, of course, uh, from Walter Sulu University and 